Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. This is Niaito from Jaku Swords, and it was sent to me for the purposes of review, so a couple quick disclaimers before I get into it. Again, review sample, I didn't spend any money on it, so if you think that makes me biased, you know, first thing. Uh, two, I do study Japanese swordsmanship, but I am not an authority in the matter. I'm not a teacher, and, you know, kind of keep my musings and ramblings uh, in, in that context. Know that I'm a hobbyist and enthusiast, but you should certainly talk to your teacher uh, before making any kind of purchase to, to make sure you're getting the right thing, particularly if you're if you're just jumping into it. Now, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with what Niaito is, it's a bit of a departure from my typical review. The first one, well, not the first one I've reviewed, but certainly it's an uncommon thing. Uh, these are really training tools, first and foremost, and so they're not live blades, they're dull, they're made to practice Iaido. Iaido, I believe, is the art. Iaito is the, the tool, the object, the dull blade that you use to practice it, and they're not meant to be weapons in the strictest sense. They're made to replicate the weight and balance and dynamics of a sword so that you can draw it and sheathe it and practice uh, your Kenjutsu or Iaido practice. And so uh, they're also not meant to be fetters as, as you might use in historical European martial arts uh, or impact weapons where you'd use them for sparring and contact. They diminish relatively quickly. You could probably get a couple strikes in, but you'd have to buy an Iaito per round or something like that. They go pretty quick. They also have pointy ends, which means that you could still certainly hurt yourself, and it would certainly hurt uh, to get whacked with them. They have thinner, still dull, but finer edges than, than uh, typically a fetter does, so you still could theoretically hurt somebody. Anyway, the point is it hurt to get whacked with one, but it's not really intended to, to do that. And to that end, it's made to mostly practice swordsmanship. It doesn't mean you have to practice swordsmanship to want one, though. Uh, if you want to fiddle with a sword and practice some of the motions and you don't officially study kenjutsu or iaido or anything like that, and you just don't want a four razor blade around your house because you have kids or some, some other such thing, then, um, then this might be an option for you. And anyway, the, the point of this one more particularly is that it's about $100. So Jeku sells these. I don't see this one exactly on their website, but I do see similar things between $90 and $120. Uh, it's a 1050 carbon steel, so it still requires some maintenance and, and, and oiling in, in that way, uh, but it's a relatively inexpensive option. Generally speaking, the Japanese Iaito that are available tend to be around $200, and, and they go up from there pretty substantially depending on the options that you have. So if you're a new student and you want to get a training tool, but you don't want to spend a lot of money, that's kind of where this, this option comes in. And, and the video here will really be to evaluate how good or bad is it uh, from that standpoint. I'll go through the general build quality and all that kind of stuff, uh, but do know that we're talking about a $100 sword that's dull and really made to practice swordsmanship. And it's that lens that I think is really important. So normally if you're going to swing a sword around, you're not drawing and sheathing and drawing and sheathing. The idea is how good is the blade, how well does it cut, um, how well is it going to hold up in that regard. This is different though. If your primary focus is to draw and sheathe, really the how it feels dynamically in your hand, how it acts as a training tool, how functional it operates as a, as a training tool for Japanese swordsmanship in particular is really the focus. Apart from, you know, how well does it cut the blade could be, could be a twig. It doesn't really matter what it is. It just has to, has to replicate kind of the feeling, but it's not really intended to impact anything. So the focus is, is fundamentally different than, well, not fundamentally, but largely focused on the fit and finish and the dynamics and, and movement properties over sharpness, blade quality, and, and any of that kind of stuff. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I will give you a kind of quick, you know, the, the end result here. And the short answer for me <laughs> in terms of do I think this is worth it because I'm going to ramble on for like 45 minutes about it is, yeah, uh, this sword initially came with some problems that needed to be addressed. I won't call them deal breakers, but you certainly might. It came with some hot spots and some uncomfortable things that I was able to address with simple tools. And in the end, for $100, I was able to get a tool that I feel comfortable using for Yaido. And that is, is saying something because generally speaking, the least expensive Japanese option is around $200. I would say that for that money, you get something a little better and a little better suited to the task more more importantly than this one is. Uh, this one functions, it's an inexpensive tool, and if you're not looking to spend a lot of money but you want a tool to practice, it is certainly a viable option, but I would say expect to have some some fiddling, some customizing that needs to happen out of the box before you really have the, the tool dialed in and ready to go for training. Alternatively, most of the Japanese swords, the, the Aito that I've gotten out of Japan or even secondhand that were made in Japan tend to be really ready to go right away and don't, don't require, haven't required, I should say, the same level of fiddling. Anyway, uh, that's the short answer for you. <laughs> I will hopefully explain why that is uh, over the next long ramble session. So here we go. I'm going to start with the Kashra. Uh, incidentally, as you're seeing the sword right now, I have cleaned it up somewhat, not cleaned it up, I've changed it somewhat, I've altered it in the condition you're seeing it in now. I'm gonna travel back in time to the condition I originally got the sword in, and I will evaluate it soup to nuts, top to bottom, and show you uh, some of the things that I like and some of the problems that I had. 
All right, so I'm going to start with the kasha, the end cap, the pommel, the little butt cap at the end here. And the main important thing about the kasha, the problem that I had was around the, the back, the mune side, uh, there was a sharp little hot spot and it rubbed into my hand in an uncomfortable way as I was drawing and moving the sword around. So depending on how you hold the sword, you might notice it, you might not. But those sharp little ledges that are left over from casting really are unacceptable when you're when you're going to be doing thousands of repetitions with the sword. Any any kind of hot or sharp spot will really rub into you in an uncomfortable way and needs to, needs to be addressed before you're, you're using it. Uh, uh, and it's unfortunate, really, that that came on the sword. It seems like an easy thing that, you know, could have been fixed out of the gate. Uh, nevertheless, that was something that I needed to address. And and anyway, that was the main discomfort thing. Other than that, uh, the textures and fittings and all that kind of stuff, I can't say are, are bad. It's in a bamboo theme, which is which is all right. And, and for $100, I'm not really expecting anything glorious here. Uh, for what it is, it's it's reasonably detailed, reasonably okay. Uh, the casting quality is, is muddy. It's certainly not the best. But again, at a $100 price point, there's really, it's tough to, to say you can expect a whole lot. Um, the fact that you're getting some texture and it looks okay, I suppose, is is really all you can hope for. And I think that's being achieved here. The etch on it was a little meh. I would say it wasn't great. And it looked like all of the fittings had some residue left over from casting, some like white stuff that was left over in them. I've taken it to a buffing wheel to clean it off and I filed off the little hot spot. And after that, it was it was okay. Um, as we move on from the kashra to the transitions of the ito, the ito, the kind of the wrap on it, it's bunched up around here, but it's reasonably tight. And so that, that much can be said. It doesn't appear loose, it doesn't wiggle, um, and the knots don't move around under pressure. So if I push on the knots, they don't, they don't move. Even after having used it for a time, the knots appear very tight, which is great to see. Very often these knots in the Ito can, the Ito can be very loose. Uh, this uh, appears to be pretty tight overall, which is, which is very good and very important to see on a sword that you intend on using and swinging around primarily, because loose Ito will, will <laughs> Will, uh, will degrade relatively quickly. It's not so bad if you're just cutting water bottles or something periodically, but if you're gonna do thousands of repetitions with the sword, uh, w with this in your hand, then loose Ito uh, degrades quickly. So it's good to see that the Ito is tight. Now, as I, as I talk about the Ito, it has a very synthetic kind of cheap feel to it, but it's not uncomfortable on the hands, and I'm sure it's it's gonna hold up reasonably well. Uh, the knots are tight, but the diamonds all run the, you know, run around in size pretty significantly. You've got big and small and all that kind of stuff. But again, for $100, it's tough to, to expect anything necessarily better. Could it be better? Sure. But it, it doesn't have to be at this price point. It just has to be functional. And, and so if you're going to dedicate energy into into something, I would say making it comfortable and functional is, is paramount when we're talking about a $100 budget sword. Uh, the diamonds being even is a nice to have, but not a necessity. Underneath, it looks like we have real Semigawa, the small nodule, nothing special. Casting quality in the Minuki appears to, we have some floral or leaf pattern Minuki there, I'm not sure what they are, uh, but they seem about the same same caliber as the, the Fuchi Kashira. And overall, the the uh, the handle has also a kind of a wasted shape. This guy has a nice wasted shape. It feels pretty good in my hand. I really, I can't say I mind the overall feel of the sword. The Fuchi doesn't line up particularly well in terms of transitions. It has a ledge here, and I would say it's uncomfortable, but it didn't rub into my hand in an uncomfortable way the same way the Kashra did. So this just appears to be a rim that isn't fit on as well as it could be rather than a, a kind of residue sharp bit left over. Uh, I did clean them up and buff them a little bit, and I could file them down perhaps, but that would degrade the, the appearance even more. Uh, as it is, it's not uncomfortable, but it is it is unsightly, and it's, well, it is uncomfortable. It's just not painful. <laughs> so I could still use this as a training tool. It might wear on me a little bit. Maybe I'd, I'd file it down, but it's not sharp is the point. So it's not hurting me as I'm trying to do general type general types of practice. Uh, incidentally, the handle comes off pretty easy. I was able to take the pegs out. I was able to take the handle off. That's important for cleaning. So if you're this sword happens to be made of 1050, so as you're handling it, if your practice requires you to touch the blade, or even if it doesn't, you're probably going to want to clean the sword. In this case, you can take the pegs out, the handle came off pretty easy, and I was able to get the fittings off to clean them. I don't know if that will always be the case, but this one in particular came off without uh, the necessity for a ton of percussive maintenance. It was a little loath to go back together, but it, <laughs> it did go back together. Uh, I had to take a rubber mallet and I had to bang it on a, on a table to get it back together, but, uh, but it did go back together, came apart a little easier. Uh, the Suba, uh, 
As I'm moving on here, uh, is I don't know exactly what this theme is. It almost looks like a, a coin of some kind, but uh, the, the Supa came with a lot more casting residue. There was little bits left over in the pockets here that indicated that you know whatever casting material it was in was still kind of stuck in those pockets and it wasn't cleaned up. And it was the most unsightly part. Now the Supa doesn't have a ton of lines or, or character to it. It's in a theme that I'm you know not necessarily in love with, but it's okay. Anyway, it doesn't ride up on my hand. If I bring my knuckles up here, nothing rubs on it, nothing sharp, nothing hurts from a practitioner standpoint. If you like the look, it certainly functions and does its job. Now I'm going to talk briefly about the habaki. Now, the, originally the habaki caught on the back, and that's really the main focal point here of problems, is that something about the way the habaki moved in and out of the mouth of the saya, the koiguchi area here, uh, was not pleasant. It would catch on things, and it disrupted my practice. Ideally, it's a very smooth transition. A little bit of file work got it there, but initially it was problematic. Aesthetically speaking, it's a handsome looking habaki. It's supposed to emulate a historical piece and it doesn't necessarily do a great job of that. But what it does is offer some character and contrast to the very standard simple brass habaki. I like that this one has a slightly more elaborate pattern on it and I think it blends well thematically with the rest of the fittings on the sword. Um, so as it is, it's good, but it did require a little bit of file work around the habaki, um, specifically where the habaki touches the blade in the mune and as well as some filing on the koiguchi to get it to, to slide in more correctly. It's still a little bit tight right now, but it's it's going to likely loosen over years of usage, and uh, it's it's about where I want it personally. Let me talk briefly about the Saya here. So um, the main complaint that I'd have is that the Shiridome were not fixed in, not glued in. Now that's something that you could do, and it's something very common on, on swords, well beyond the $100 price point. But basically, if you're going to use the sword, you're going to untie the little pretty presentation knot it comes in and then those shiridome things just fall out and end up scratching your scabbard and stuff like that. So I just remove them and I, I'm perfectly happy with the result of, of simply removing them. Uh, the koiguchi actually has a, a nice fit to it. It has uh, basically what looks like horn. I don't know if it is horn. It could certainly be plastic, but you can see that the wood rim on the inside is raised up and that's generally speaking how the scabbard is supposed to be made usually with hundred dollar swords they don't bother with this type of configuration it's it's a you know a cheaper different variation which i will attempt to show you in the screen overlay uh, what we also have here is a horn kurigata which is nice looking or plastic it emulates horn anyway and a horn uh, kojiri at the end here uh, so the horn is nice you can kind of see here that from practicing i do some iaido which is kind of seated and I might bang the, the scabbard on the ground. The horn kind of keeps it together a little bit better than simple wood wood. Wood wood. That's funny. Anyway, uh, paint on here is an Ishime. It's kind of a stone wash kind of kind of pattern on it. It tends to hold up pretty well. It also, because it has some splatter pattern, if you chip it, it's easy to kind of touch up with a Sharpie and not necessarily notice it. So for beginning practice, if you're going to thump it around, this is a good finish to have. Gloss is a lot easier to ding up and and a little harder to fix, but this bladder pattern tends to hold together well. Incidentally, it also came with a long enough segeo for me to do Toyama Ryu, which is, generally speaking, I need a longer segeo to, to, to tie it in properly on my fat self, and, uh, and this one came with a long enough segeo to do it. You can always trim the segeo, but you can't necessarily make it longer. Now, as I noted earlier, the Koiguchi area was a little tight. I took some files and filed it down to get it to fit properly. That was a little futzing that had to, had to happen. But obviously, I could make it, I could file it down inside easier than I could glue and shim uh, to, to make it tighter. So tighter and needing to loosen is preferred to <laughs> too loose and having to glue stuff in, which can be more problematic. Now, I'm going to talk about the blade, the pointy, pointy, stabby part. So a couple quick notes. It has a bohi, and that runs the well, the length of the blade, as, as Bohi often do, it has a wire brushed hamon on it, which I can tell they've kind of missed the pattern in a few spots. It, it has some imperfections that you can spot in the right light, namely on the Kasaki area here, where it looks like they just kind of slapped it on the wire brush because the, the, the scratch line kind of runs through, <laughs> through the Bohi and it doesn't follow the plane the way it would supposed to, the way it's, it's really supposed to. But at $100, it's tough to really know what to expect. And the fact that it has the aesthetics of a, of a bohi on it, albeit wire brushed, and the fact that it has some attempt at making a Kisaki Yakote type area, um, that could be theoretically helpful. Anyway, it, it makes the sword more pleasant in appearance, at least to me, I'd rather have them than just have a mirror polished blade, even though it's imperfect, it's, it's nice that it's there and it certainly uh, makes it more pleasant to, to me aesthetically. Uh, in terms of the, the bohi, sometimes that can help in, in the audible nature of the sword. So 
you can probably hear it slightly. So I think part of the reason for that is the taper here. So we have a pretty thick uh, spine on the blade and it has a lot of distal taper. It goes down to a couple millimeters out at the tip here. It becomes very thin and it doesn't swell out like some of the, the swords generally do. Uh, it has a lot of taper and, and that is, it's just generally quite a bit different. And that does help with the weight. So it feels like something I could do a lot of repetitions with. It's a pretty comfortable weight for an Yaito. Generally speaking, Yaito are a little bit lighter than their than their Shenkin counterparts or their live blade counterparts because you're doing hundreds or thousands of repetitions with them. And you want something that, you know, a tool that you can train with comfortably for a while. And if you want heavier options, I'm sure they're available, but I would I would certainly prefer something lighter if I'm going to be doing hours of practice at a time. Uh, the point is that this is achieved largely, I think, through distal taper. It tapers a lot more than commonly it uh, it, it would on most katana. And uh, the edge here, incidentally, isn't sharp, but it's thin enough where if you really clock somebody with it, it could, it could theoretically cut them. It's not enough to, you know, if I pull it across my fingers, it's not cutting me, but... Uh, it's, it's thin enough where it, it could, could be more dangerous than some of the thicker ends here. But again, it's not meant to really contact other swords. It's meant to draw and sheath. And so as it is, the balance is achieved. It's, it's comfortable enough to use. Uh, and overall, it, you know, it, it makes the hasuji or the wind sound. Um, and it's dull and doesn't cut you. And it has a reasonably appropriate appearance. It's also, if I haven't mentioned, carbon steel, so you do have to oil it, you do have to wipe it down. That could be a good or bad thing to you depending on your, your preference. I generally prefer the zinc aluminum stuff because I don't like having to clean up afterwards. I like being able to put my sword away and just move on. Uh, but if you want to build up some good habits because any, any carbon steel sword you want to oil after you're done, this will help you build those habits because you will, you will have to oil it. Anyway, I do now that I've talked about the blade, I think I've pretty much exhausted what uh, what I have to say about the blade. I want to highlight some of the, the fixes that I did. So uh, initially when I got the sword, there were just some uncomfortable things that I thought needed to be addressed. First and foremost was this hot spot on the Kashra. It really rubbed into the fat of my hand and made it uncomfortable. Uh, and so I took it out to get some filing done. And in the process of filing, I have diminished the Ito slightly. So it's frayed a little bit from taking a file and sanding it off, but it's still likely has plenty of life in it, but knew, know that my clumsiness resulted in some fraying of the Ito. Uh, theoretically, I could lacquer the Ito here and it would likely, you know, bring down the, the fraying on it and it would make it probably more more appealing in, in appearance. Um, but do know that you have to be kind of gingerly with the filing, otherwise you might make the Ito frayed. And it'd be nice if Jayco just took a little extra effort and made sure that any kind of sharp spots on the fittings were addressed prior to prior to attaching them, because fixing them, you know, if you're clumsy like me, uh, can result in diminishing the, the capability or the caliber of the Ito here, or make it fray, and that's unsightly. Uh, the other thing I did is I just buffed the, the fittings. I wasn't a big fan of the patina that was on them. More so, I wasn't a fan of the kind of white gunk that was stuck in there, which I believe is residue left over from the casting process. So I just took it to a buffing wheel, I put some green compound on the wheel, and just went over it. Uh, I did it with the handle off and it was pretty easy. I did it on the habaki and I did it on the suba. And so you can see that now it's it's a little shinier and maybe that's to your taste, maybe it's not. I can't say I'm personally a fan really either way, but uh, as it is, I don't necessarily mind the appearance and more so the hot spots are, are off the sword and it's more comfortable to use now. And I'm not as bothered by the residue. It doesn't look dirty. It, it looks maybe cheap, but it doesn't look as dirty. So I, I prefer that. The other bits that I did were to the Saya. So I removed the Shiridome and I filed this area here around the Koiguchi. I did kind of front and back, not on the sides, and widened it slightly. I also filed along the spine on the Mune. There was a ledge here, and I took a file and I rubbed it against the spine. So it's discolored and it, it doesn't line up as well. But now, when I sheathe the sword, it goes in without kind of sticking. Before, it wouldn't fall in, that would catch on the habaki, and now uh, the sword will fall in. It's about the appropriate tightness. It does still have a loud sound to it. You know, it's still a little noisy, but there's not, you know, maybe I could try cleaning it out or something like that. But as it is, I think it's functional as a training tool. So for comparison, this is a relatively inexpensive Iaito from... Uh, I believe Minasoka, it's one of the basic ones from Tizando shop. And you can hear, it still has some kind of raspiness in the in the Saya, um, but it fits in. You can notice that it doesn't catch up until kind of the last couple millimeters is where it's catching on the Saya, and that's, <laughs> I suppose, more ideal. It doesn't fall out. Overall, the fittings are all, are all tight. You can notice that the diamonds 
on the Ito are, are reasonably well shaped and the transitions between all of the fittings are also pretty good. And so it lines up and it feels the, kind of the way it's supposed to in your hand. You can see here the way the Kisaki looks. It has a hamon that is wire brushed on, albeit, but we have kind of a, a, a Yakote line and, and some attempt at leaving the spine uh, a, a different color. And this is the you know kind of inexpensive baseline piece. I believe it's around 300 bucks. I could be wrong on that. I'll try to try to show the example here, but this is also made of zinc aluminum. I don't have to clean it. That could be a pro or a con, and it's pretty uniform in its thickness and sharpness all the way up to the edge. Uh, it has a nice sound to it. It's much easier to get that sound, which is important if you're studying Japanese swordsmanship, because if I do it wrong, it doesn't make the sound. If I do it kind of right, then it's easier to get that sound, which is helpful as a tool. So uh, this just kind of came out of the box. Now, I did buy this used, but uh, I got it used from somebody who didn't really use it very much, I suppose I should say. So it's relatively new. And the fittings, I would say, uh, in terms of level of detail and all that kind of stuff, are actually below the, the Jeku option here. They, they seem to even be muddier in casting quality. But all the little things, transitions, what bites you, how it feels in your hand, uh, how it makes noise, all of those things are more the way they're supposed to be than the Jeku piece is. And so, you know, for, for spending a little bit more money, uh, I, I would certainly say it's worth it. I like, I would prefer to use this as a training tool over the Jeku piece. However, I could have three of the Jeku pieces before I could have one of these. So uh, I would say that for the money, I certainly think buying something more expensive is worth it. Uh, but if you don't have it and you want a training tool, I would rather have a training tool, I would rather practice with this than a Boken. And if this is what your budget allows, then I certainly think it is a viable training tool, but just know the things that you're, you're sacrificing on. Uh, can it impact your practice? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly helpful to have a tool with all the, the, the things nipped and tucked to move exactly the way they're supposed to, because some of Kenjutsu uh, assumes that your sword, it works and, and functions and slides and moves in a particular way. And when it doesn't, it can, impede your ability to learn the technique you're trying to learn. As a side note, I do have a couple other Iaito to show. So this is a much larger Iaito and it's made to be heavy. It's longer and it's heavier and I, <laughs> I, can't, I don't know exactly how long or heavy it is, but I can tell you it is, it is much. And so when I want to practice with a sword that is dull and I want to try to develop speed with a blade that's heavy, I use one of these. Now, do I train with a live blade? Generally speaking, no. Um, if I'm cutting, I do, and I will generally do some Iaido uh, when I'm practicing with swords I review, but I, I try to avoid it when I'm actually trying to learn stuff because if I'm trying to build speed or trying to work on a technique or trying to move at pace, then uh, using a sharp sword is really, really dangerous. <laughs> and uh, it, it lets me train safer. So if I want something that more replicates some of the bigger swords that I use, uh, I use this, this beast right here. And there are heavier things available. Presumably you could ask Jayco for a heavier sword if it's what you're after. There are also higher end EI2 available. This would likely cost over $1,000 now. I'm not sure exactly how much it would be, but it's an older piece from Tizando that I tend to use probably most. It's a little bit on the longer side, but it's also um, just, I don't know, it's a very pleasant looking sword, aesthetically speaking, and it fits me really well. It makes the Hasuji, the wind sound, the Tachikaze, I can't remember what it's called, but it's easy enough to get that sound. And, uh, and overall, it has a very aesthetically pleasant look. It has additional kind of ribbing on the Saya and rattan wrapping up here. And overall, it's a very handsome sword, uh, but it would be very expensive to get. And as a training tool, this is probably what I use most. I really enjoy using it, but any of these Yaito are, are all things that, that could be used. Now you notice that I have three of them that I use commonly for practice. I have the one that I use the most with some elaborate fittings and stuff like that. I have a heavy one for when I want to practice strength or, or moving around a, a hefty one. And then I have a relatively basic and expensive one that I can use for travel because one time I lost my sword and I, you know, now if I travel to events, I use a less expensive one. All right, so where I'd like to end this video is I do think that this sword is a viable option for 100 bucks. It does the job, and albeit with a little bit of fiddling, but it does the job of an Iaito for $100. And I would rather practice with a $100 Iaito that I had to fiddle with to get right than a $300 Boken and continue to try and do uh, the, the movements with a stick. And I think a lot of people practice with a Boken first, generally speaking, and then uh, then buy an Iaito. And if you're trying to do that on a budget, I think this is a viable viable option for you. Now, it does come at a cost, obviously. Well, not just $100, but I had to fiddle with it. And 
more than that, uh, the more expensive products are more fun to train with. They were more convenient and worked right out of the box and, and all of that. So if you have the money and your budget allows it, I'd certainly advocate buying a more expensive EI to train with. It enhances my experience and, and I would certainly advocate, uh, advocate and recommend that you spend it if you have the budget. But if you don't, then you can get a sword that's going to do the job for a hundred bucks. And I think this is, this is certainly a viable option. Hopefully this video has given you some idea of what to expect for a hundred bucks. If you're looking for any Ito, I'd venture a guess that Jayco's offerings are relatively similar to some of the other hundred dollar price point objects options out there and what uh, tools and futzing about might be required to, to get it dialed in in such a way that it's a little bit more comfortable to use for hundreds or thousands of repetitions. Anyway, uh, I think I've rambled enough, so I'm going to call it here and say cheers and thanks for watching. Slight PS for this video, sword friends. I am going to donate this sword to the Toyama Ryu Dojo that I attend. Generally speaking, I break swords that are sent to me for review samples. Not always, but generally speaking, that's what I do. In this case, breaking it or abusing it wouldn't really be helpful. It's an Iaito. It's not meant to be broken or abused. It's meant to be used, and ideally, how long it holds up over many years of use is the most relevant thing that I can contribute to the conversation. So my uh, my goal here is I'm going to donate it to the Toyama Dojo that I that I attend. It will be our dojo blade and, and new student can use it when they move away from a boken and into an Iaito and it will hopefully inform them on uh, what size they like or, or where they want to spend their money and that's the goal maybe in some years I'll revisit and see how well it has held up over over many many years of use um, and that will I think be the best way I can contribute to the conversation here so that's the that's the destiny for this sword it's not going to be broken and if that's what you're tuning in for then I'm sorry you were probably disappointed for the, the whole random ramble session that I tend to throw out anyway uh, for those of you interested that's where it's going Cheers, and thanks for watching.